Hello everybody, welcome back into the studio for the final installment in the Chronos Portrait Study series. It's been a long time coming. In this video tutorial, we are going to cover how you can finish your sculpture, how to get a good surface on your sculpture, and what even is a good surface, what does it even mean. This video will have a lot of footage, but it's not going to have the same amount of voiceover as some other videos. The process of finishing a sculpture is time consuming, and while there are certainly things to talk about, there are perhaps less to talk about compared to other stages in the process. So expect a little bit less dialogue here compared to what you're used to. Essentially, this video is about the fit and finish of a piece, the craftsmanship that has to take place to bring a piece over the finish line. Let's get into it. Let's start with talking about the fit and finish of a sculpture and what it does mean. The sculpture should be made to appear good, look good, from a distance first and foremost. All of our decisions are made from a distance and this ensures that the piece, pieces, every piece that we make, works and looks good from across the room where people will see it first. Now for me this isn't enough however. This is where fit and finish comes in to play, at least in my work. I want people to be able to walk up to my work and the visual effect the piece has from a distance on them shouldn't change for the negative when we walk up to it. In fact, it should change for the better or at least the same. I want them to be able to walk up to my work and have details and carefully crafted textures to marvel at. We have to balance these two worlds and make sure that the most important one from a distance works first, before getting close to our work and starting the time-consuming and detail-oriented process of fit and finish. Things like the eyeballs being properly round is something I would categorize as fit and finish. It's going to matter, but perhaps only to me or perhaps only to the few who knows sculpture well. An issue that can occur if the eyeballs aren't properly round like they are in real life, they are spheres after all, is that they can look like they are aimed in a direction you don't intend them to be aimed in. Like they're not looking in the direction that your iris and pupil is actually aiming. The eyeballs are spheres and so there need to be the possibility for them to exist within the structure of the skull and the lids needs to be able to cover them. Sometimes the visible part of the sphere of the eyeball isn't round enough. What we can see of the white of the eye in other words, is too flat from the side view, and it can then appear like the sphere is too large for the lids and the sockets which it's placed within. Always think of the eyeball as being a sphere, and imagine the size of the eyeball within the eye socket. Make sure that it could feasibly fit within the structures that surround it. Aiming the eyes is a tricky thing that we also have to consider, of course. Very often the eyes are made to look like they are looking at something that is a little bit too close, making them look slightly cross-eyed when we step back from our work. The solution is simple and something I harp on constantly in my videos. It is to step back from your work and make sure that the piece functions well from a distance first, before anything else. Does the eyes appear to be looking at you when you step back from the piece? This is the question you want to ask yourself. Now if they do, you should be much better off than if they appear to be staring at you when you're up close, for example, rendering the surface of the piece or sculpting details. If they appear to be looking at you from a distance, they will rarely look weird. And even if you get close to the piece, they just sort of end up looking past you in a dragon-eyed sort of way. But if you sculpt them to look at you super close, if you're up close and make the eyes look like they're looking at you while you're close, then they will easily start looking like they're cross-eyed when we step back from the work, which is obviously not a great effect that we want. Unless intended for a specific reason, be careful about having the eyes of your sculpture aimed at something too close to the sculpture itself.
Sharp edges and soft edges can be manipulated to draw attention or to direct attention away from certain things. Luckily, in the human portrait, we have details where we want to draw attention by default, and plenty of chances because of this to manipulate sharp and soft edges. Particularly the edge around the iris is something that I like to keep pretty sharp in order for the attention to be drawn there. At the same time, the corners of the eyes are treated in a slightly softer manner so that they take less attention and direct the attention towards the gaze of the eyes. This is certainly a bit theoretical, and people look where they want to look, of course, but it can be fun to play with these kinds of effects, and they do perhaps play a role in what we direct our attention to as viewers, if nothing else, at least subconsciously. You'll see me throughout the whole video working on softening things down a touch so that the attention is directed towards intentionally sharp edges, like some of the details in and around the eyes. In general, people tend to make things way too sharp, and I'm the same way, I suffer very much from the same problem. And so it's something to always worry about and try to contend with in my own work. I've even developed a slightly modified process for myself that aims to correct some of those issues with sharpness through process and less through decision making. Hopefully solving some of my issues with decision making by making them part of the process instead. But that will be covered in some videos in depth in the future perhaps, though we do touch on it at the end of this video. Worrying about how to make things softer and more flesh-like is always going to be something that will be helpful to your work, and so thinking about that more so than creating sharp edges is perhaps a better strategy. So essentially what I'm saying there is don't look for places to make sharp edges, Look for places to make things softer so that something else stands out as sharp. Contrast is the key to all of this, of course. Two things will be happening a lot in this video. Raking down the surface and using a loop tool to soften everything and adding microscopic amounts of volume to forms using a wood tool or my hands to apply the clay. Let's talk about the second one first, as ideally this is the one that happens first. So as we all know by now, very little in the sculpting process goes according to plan. I think something Mike Tyson once said probably applies here. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. And it's sort of like that in sculpture. We have a plan to begin with, and then reality and the sculpture has its say. Sometimes the model has his or hers say, and that plan has to be adjusted for and, and changed. At least, this is the typical course that a piece takes on. At least when I work on it. So small amounts of volume is added in some places with the intent of creating a sense of roundness or softness. A problem with using rakes as a tool of softening, or loops for that matter, is that they can often remove too much clay in the pursuit of making something appear to be soft. This leaves us with a flat sculpture, which we don't want. We want a softly undulating surface, and raking our positive forms down makes them flat, and so the transitions become soft, but we then miss out on the softly undulating part of the surface that we are after. It doesn't really achieve the right effect, in, a, in, in other words. In many ways, a softer salt has much more to do with how round and volumetric you make those positive forms. You can make something a bit rounder with the rake, perhaps, take down some edges, perhaps. But not really to as great an extent as we think. Or as it perhaps first appears. Adding clay and volume is going to be the solution to most of your problems. But before we do that, the question becomes, where do we add clay? Because we can't add it wherever we want to without creating a whole bunch of problems for ourselves, of course. We have to respect the work that came before, the work that we did before we got to this point. This means not working outside the contours that we established from each of the four views. 
Doing so will alter the overall sense of proportion, and though we are not working from life or a model in this particular instance, I'm working from imagination here, we do have established height and width ratios that we are pleased with. So unintentionally changing those is not something we want to do. And so to make sure we don't change those ratios, we respect the contours that we have established. We have also established the internal information, or the shape design, inside our contours, and the addition of microvolumes should also respect this and not change it. You can accidentally push forms around by adding volume at the edge of a form, for example, which would make the form wider, or make the transition between two forms smaller. And if we've worked hard to establish what we believe to be good shape design, which we should have done by this point, of course, we don't want to change it, and we certainly do not want to change it by accident. 